All right. So in terms of these, uh, this session, uh, I'm sure you've been here for the past couple of days, and we might have some new guests today. So why don't we start the session from starting uh, introducing yourself and what do you do for your respective uh, business? Morning, everyone. I work at MediaCorp. Bloomer is a social media creative studio at the company. We basically started out as uh, MediaCorp's answer to trying to connect YouTubers and Instagrammers to MediaCorp brands. And it grew from there. We then started to incorporate social media listening and a bunch of other components. And at this stage, we basically now incorporate everything that we can into campaign marketing, to anything that the content creators can work with MediaCorp. Okay, and Nikki, so what do you do, what do, you do for your startup? <laughs> <laughs> Please don't quote me on that. Um, <laughs> it's a joke. <laughs> Uh, but hi everyone, I'm Nikki. I work for the uh, for Google's video content solutions team. Uh, we service Southeast Asia and South Asia advertisers. Uh, my team basically, well not my team, the team. <laughs> the team drives and develops advertising solutions on uh, YouTube's video content. And I look after the music and gaming categories specifically. Wow, that's But we have interesting. other people looking after the other categories like sports and tech and stuff. Right, right. So obviously the both of you handle directly with a lot of creators, right? So why don't we uh, start with how do you actually work with the creators from, you know, your uh, Bloomer perspective and also from YouTube? Yeah. How do we work with creators? <laughs> Uh, I think we go uh, from end to end on the majority of how you can collaborate with a content creator, either from uh, people that have never done any content, that we train them to start to produce their own content and eventually get their own uh, brand deals and become consistent content creators, to really established uh, multi-region famous uh, celebrities that we then do the inverse. So they are famous on TV or famous on uh, a platform like MeWatch, our OTT platform. And we try to adapt the way that they think of content and help them create content on YouTube, create content on TikTok, where, wherever they need to produce the content. How do you say is a life cycle? How long would it take somebody who is not a content creator to begin with to, you know, to educate them, to train them to be a content creator? So starting from scratch. Starting from scratch. Yeah, for example, me, right? <laughs> like I am not the youngest person in the crowd, but I constantly, you know, I'm very curious about, wow, I think people like me. Why don't I just start a channel? But when I start posting, I just don't get no tractions, right? So how would you help me to, how would you incubate uh, me and train me to become a content creator? So depending on the vertical that you want to create your content for, it really depends on how much content you're producing. So to Mingwei's point before, consistency of production is one of the key aspects of what we try to train to people because it's counterintuitive to constantly be thinking of content. And as well, it's counterintuitive to always think of not just the content that you're producing, but to think that you are talking to other people in the content that you are producing. So it's that mental disconnect that we try to imbue in the majority of the content creators so that they can then be specific on the verticals that they want to produce. So if I tell a YouTuber that you are now competing with another 150 YouTubers in Singapore, they need to understand that, okay, so you have to produce good quality content that communicates to our, your audience and is consistent throughout. Right? That's not an easy thing for most people to understand. Absolutely, because I just think that I'm just like another 100 person out there. What are my competitive advantages, right? We're like, what are the content that I should produce? But this is something that Bloomer can exactly teach creators to, to, to guide them through, right? So we can go through a bunch of different ways of how we pinpoint your strengths. Right. Ah. So through our accelerator program, if you are making content, we try to make sure that you align to the necessities of the market. And if you are not, after the six months of going through the program, we start to slowly nudge you in a different direction. Wait, did you say six months? Yeah. So it's kind of like a probation period, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> it is. So that's how we think of it. So you go through the accelerator, the first and the second year, then you go in through an incubation process at the company, and then you kind of graduate into a contract with our celebrity agency afterwards. Oh, 
so you guys also have the connection with a celebrity agency. So maybe one day I could be a celebrity in the region. <laughs> or not. But. We work very closely with the other units at the company because we are basically a feeder system of content creators to, for the rest of the company. So not only if you are a Channel 5 or a Channel 8 or any other type of brand that produces content at MediaCorp that you see talent that looks like it's amazing. So to Mingwei's point before, you can do six figures producing that type of content on a monthly basis. When you get after the incubator and become a technical celebrity in our eyes. Yeah. Awesome. I'm definitely getting your business card after the session. <laughs> and Nikki, so tell us how you guys were creators. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So the team actually, um, we a lot of a large part of our job is actually to build packages and solutions around big advertiser-led moments. So very broadly, if you're thinking about like uh, festive moments, Christmas, Chinese New Year, um, because I work in the music category, so obviously when there's a huge tempo moment, like when Blackpink releases a music video or when Blackpink is in town for concert, you know, we kind of help brands develop uh, solutioning around that. And a large part of it, we always try to incorporate a creator solution. I mean, it's a very natural fit because, of course, YouTube is, you know, there's such a large network of creators that are on the platform. So, um, yeah, we, we try to link uh, brands up with the right creator. And not only that, but also offer a media amplification plan because obviously there's YouTube advertising. <laughs> and um, actually, we work a lot with... Uh, companies like Bloomer as well because they have obviously a roster of YouTube creators that we can then just hit oh, well, hit Diogo up and be like, hey, <laughs> what are some creators we can use for this brand? So um, yeah, that's how we work with creators. Uh, I see. So Because I was going to say, there are so many creators on YouTube, right? How do we actually make the selections to cater to what the brand is really looking for, right? Yeah. Exactly. So agencies like um, Bloomer actually really, really help us with that. So I guess, Diogo, from your perspective, you work with brands directly, right? Regardless, it's just brands on its own. We reach out to you or for Media Corp. There are a lot of potential brands and sponsors to begin with. Do you also provide solutions for brands as to match them with the right creators? Either the brand or the agency. So it really depends on the first point of contact. I mean, brands and agencies. Yeah, so when it's agency, it's a more broad spectrum so they usually have the briefs that come to Bloomer and of course then my campaign managers pinpoint the content creators that should be working with the brand. When it's uh, brand ambassadorship or sponsorship those are long term relationships. It's a long dating process to get them to collaborate, right? So one of the big aspects of what we then do on a day to day basis is how do we connect our salespeople at MediaCorp which is around 120 people to the content creators that are in our roster. So it can vary between us getting a thousand briefs in a quarter to uh, getting a hundred creators with ideas to try to match those thousand briefs. So it, it's complicated to go through a lot of the, the information and a lot of the briefs and the pitches that we try to connect them with, right? But uh, in my opinion, that's the easier part of the job, making sure that the creators are making great content, making sure that they're posting consistently, making sure that they're collaborating with each other. I think that's the tougher part of what we do. Right. So in terms of creators, I mean, obviously you are helping to incubate these creators, right? Do you, do both of you feel like, you know, is it the bigger the creator is, the more follower subscriber it is, the more successful the creator is, or more sellable to the brands? Or is actually more open? Um, I really think it depends on the campaign brief and the client ask, um, but typically when you know a client comes to us for creators is usually based on two objectives, right? Reach and relevance. So it obviously helps if you have reach, um, but sometimes it's all about relevance as well because you know some brands just want to reach a very niche specific audience, and I think you know, creators that have that specific um, content that they produce, that if it meets the brand's brief, I believe, you know, that could be a very strong proposition for a brand to want to engage you as well. So I don't, I believe it's, you know, really contingent on what the brand needs. Yeah. So yeah, to answer the question, 
I don't think it's all about right. <laughs> following, but it helps. It definitely helps. Right. So in terms of from, I guess, Bloomer, in terms of the, the creator talent management and strategy, right, you have to plan, plan out their kind of career path for them as well, right? Do you actually cater to them to be a, a lot more monetizable in the future or, you know, to work with brands easily? Or do you want them to grow on their own to have some authenticity to begin with and then eventually, you know, to cater to what brands need? Or it's all a mix of both strategies. <laughs> It can be a mix. In, so I have a very distorted view of the market, to be honest. Okay, we'd like to hear it. <laughs> we have way too much data on the content creator business and how much money p people are making, how much our competitors are making, how much the content creators are making, and how that's unsustainable for how Singapore works. Uh, one of the key aspects of the data that we go through with the government entities and everyone else that collaborates with us is trying to amper inflation in prices because you can have a content creator that has uh, to Mingwei's point before 10,000 followers and is making five figures right when the content is not performing for agencies or for brands which of course then falls to me to justify to a brand or a client why the hell didn't the con content perform right. right and then because a lot of content creators in the country are spoiled by the money that they're making with the brands they then think that they shouldn't make the content that they made for brands work inorganically, right? So one of them, of course, is what, trying to boost your content. The other one is you maybe should create more content to make sure that your brand deal actually worked. But for them, it's, oh, no, no, I was paid for one video that was one minute. I'm not doing anything else to make sure that it works, right? So a lot of the poking and prodding that we do with the, the creators in a very early stage of their careers is if you're building a relationship, you want to make sure that the other person in the room likes you. Right, the same way as if I'm going on a date with a woman, I'm not just letting the woman talk or myself talk and there's no back and forth, right? So there needs to be that uh, sensitivity to what being social on social media means. And that's a lot of, that's the most painful conversations that I usually have, which is trying to educate someone that's spoiled by the market to make money, that if they keep doing something like that in the next two years, they won't have a business. Right? They will stagnate because that's the nature of most platforms. Right? And at a certain point, either their audience grows older out of their vertical or they might do a misstep and then immediately there's no money. Right? So that's how you see content creators disappear. That's how you get content creators to burn out. And that's how basically you build an unsustainable ecosystem. Right, absolutely. Nikki, do obviously you work with a lot of uh, creators and stuff like that, right? Do you usually recommend the brands to work with creators that are more authentic or some, some of them are relatively more commercial sort of driven or is it a combination? Um, I think, as I mentioned, like when, we, when, when brands speak to us, you know, they, they usually come to us like, and tell us, okay, we need someone with reach, we need someone, um, you know, like it, it's usually an awareness kind of campaign. So we do try to sieve out the creators that have reach, but also relevant. Something that, you know, if, for example, a um, beauty brand comes to us, and obviously we would suggest, you know, creators that excel in that, that, con that, in that conversation and in that content. So, um, so yeah, we, we do try to work with creators that do have both reach and relevance. So in terms of content format, right? You have brands, you have advertisers, you have creators. What sort of sort sort of content format that you would kind of work with the creators and the brands? Is it branded content or, you know, or is it yeah? Yeah, it's usually branded content. So it would be either uh, long form content, but obviously now we have shorts. So we do integrate a lot of, um, we do get the creators to also help us create um, short form content. And what we do is actually like part of it is usually just a cut down of the long form. So then we create a very seamless journey for the viewer. So if, whether you're watching, you know, um, you know, when it's mobile first, which is shorts, like people usually consume shorts on mobile, it will ultimately lead the viewer to the long form content and create that kind of like seamless viewing experience. So yeah, for sure, um, long form and then now short form as well. <laughs> 
So you would recommend creators to create not only long form but short short form content, right? Yeah, absolutely. Just more ways to amplify your presence on YouTube. And and often time the content strategy is really different because I think short form content is even more difficult to produce, right? Because you need to translate an idea within 30, uh, 30 seconds and sometimes with a twist. Sometimes it has to be really funny, right? So how do you is is, is this something that Bloomers educating the creator to to work on as well? Definitely. So uh, in our classes, we bring specialists from YouTube, we bring specialists from TikTok, from Meta, to come and teach our content creators how to build the best possible content for the platform. And to my boss's point that was here a couple of days ago, Perry, you need to have a multi-format strategy across the content that you're producing. So it can be, yes, you're creating short form, long form across social media platforms. But you, when you graduate from a certain level of content creator, the case in Singapore is that a lot of content creators build uh, white label content for brands, for agencies, for uh, distributors my, like myself, where they might be producing a web series, for example. So it's 20 episodes of 30 minutes. So someone that has been trained for the past 10 years to create 30 second goofy uh, videos, I can then hire and collaborate with our writers at the company, our producers, okay, I need your ideas, I need your creativity, and build now a piece of content or an IP for the Gen Zs that makes sense across a long, like really long format, right? So that's one of the key things that we try to imbue in the mentality that is, okay, so now you have YouTube Shorts, you had TikTok before, you're going to have Instagram Reels, everything is going to be monetized. You can make a career out of that, right? But what is here in 10 years, right? Uh, what is here in 20 years? Are you still making 30-second videos that engages with an audience? Or do you want to create that vlog series or documentaries that you go around the world and make 20 minute videos, for example. YouTube is a great platform to produce that type of content. Um, but you then have content distributors like MediaCorp, like Astro in Malaysia, like any other type of distributor that we're always looking for great content for our platforms, right? So that's a completely different way of looking at content as well. I mean, it is a lot of work to be a creator in this world, especially when there are, there are a few core platforms out there which actually, you know, provides the most viewership. But also, there are so many emergent ones, and sometimes I feel like creators just need to, you know, they're a bit lost, right? I have to create this and that, and they spend so much time, like, focusing on creating content, and then just feel like they're just kind of feeling burned out sometimes as well, right? Um, so, I mean, for your perspective, you also handle celebrities, right? Um, I think celebrity is an interesting group of creatures because they were never, I mean, everybody's a content creator, but they're, they create content in a different sort of sector. It could be like concerts, like Blackpink, right? And also movies or TV shows. So, you know, how can you help them to change their mindset into the more social media driven platform and create content that is related to you know their target audience not just the the, the blockbuster stuff yeah so um interestingly i don't know if it's interesting you guys be the judge of that i used to work for a record label i used ah, to work right. for universal music so um obviously we manage a lot of artists um around the region uh we have internet uh, no we well, universal has international artists but also regional artists and we always well a part of it was, you know, you're an artist, but also, you know, find a way to create shoulder content, especially on YouTube, because it does help you grow your community. It helps you to, you know, be more personable. And I think the K-pop groups are actually really, like, the gold standard in doing that. Like, if you see, um, for the likes of BTS, you know, they not only release, like, official music videos, but they're still producing shoulder content on a regular basis. And... Um, you're right, um, there is a level of education that needs to be done. And um, so far, I think all the artists I've met so far have been really receptive and they understand the value of doing that because it really does help, um, you know, reach fans, you know, even when they're off peak, you know, in the period where, you know, maybe they're not producing, you know, the, 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 the artists, like, I mean, the music videos and the official kind of, um, like, live stream concerts and stuff like that, that's a way for you to sustain 
the channel viewership on YouTube. So, yeah, I think, um, yeah, so, so you, to answer your question, <laughs> a lot of artists and I guess celebrities have yeah. been really receptive whenever we speak to them about creating shorter content on YouTube. Right, and then the shorter content is usually more social. Right? They are more interactive, more, more personal. A oh, personal, right? Yeah. So, from your perspective, do you have have you had any difficulties trying to convince celebrities, like, hey, why don't you post something on TikTok? Right? Have you faced any, you know, op oppositions and stuff like that? <laughs> You don't have to name names. <laughs> usually, name names. <laughs> usually, oh, the, 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 usually the fight back doesn't really come from the celebrities. It comes from the celebrity handlers. Oh, right? the handlers. So, yeah, because so they create, like with any good story, you create a level of uh, mystery and drama around a name. Right. right. How do you get passed by their publicist, you know, their comms team, yeah. right? So All that fun stuff. If you can imagine like a big name celebrity in Singapore that probably posts once or twice a week or a month on social media, um, that is very appealing for a brand to come to them and say, yes, I really want to work with you because you are a national brand, right? And I want to connect my brand to yours. So that collaboration makes sense. But there are younger celebrities that do not see their careers that way. So they start to see themselves as content creators, but celebrities at the same time. So we start to see the two tracks mingling, right? That's where I come in. Like I, I try to make sure that the mingling is a, as much as possible, yeah. Right, but I, but I think I think a lot of my challenges, because the business that I used to be, we actually represent a lot of Hollywood celebrities, NBA players in China, which you can tell a lot of the times when we tell them to do localized content, there's sometimes they're just like, why? Why do I have to do this? And then their comms team come in immediately, they're, no, 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 they're not doing that, right? But actually, we tell them this is very relevant to the Chinese, Chinese market. That's what everybody wants to see, right? So that's why I'm very curious, you know, like, like, you, like you said, the handlers, the agents. So I think in terms of creativities, when it comes to localization, when it comes to, oh, like, because I've seen, uh, I guess, maybe Jessica Alba, right? You know, she's like the sweetheart, but she's been doing all these, like, dance things, which I thought it was all in the beginning, but eventually I was just like, okay, maybe that's just the thing that she does so have it, do you have to you know like spend a lot of time to convince them or what are the do you feel like in terms of content short form content and social content do you need to be a little bit more careful and you know throwing the right creativities to, to, to introduce to them it, it depends on the celebrity ah. it really depends on the celebrity so uh, we've been working with a kid a 20 year old kid uh, that he's been producing a lot of uh, drama, drama shows, right? So he's seen as a dramatic actor and he's fantastic at what he does. But we've tried to convince him to be more in tune to his TikTok audience. So he tends to post a lot of his clips of himself acting and like very serious, very complicated acting. And we slowly started poking him to say like, can you try to do something that's a bit light right, on TikTok? Yeah. And the reality is that the first, first single video that he created while he was in the behind the scenes of the show, he just did a, a stupid stunt to joke around. He got 50 million views on TikTok immediately. And it became national news, right? And for us, it was vindication to the rest of the celebrities that we work with, like, see, this is what we want you to do on a regular basis. But that pushback always comes with, yeah, but now he's being seen as a goofy guy rather than the serious actor that he wants to be, right? So that's the conversation more with the management and the, the talent handlers and everyone else that we have to have. Well, we're running out of time, but I feel like we can talk forever because there's so much to be shared with everyone. So thank you for the guests, and please clap for, for the guests as well. Thank, thank you so much. much. Make sure to get their business card if you want to be successful. <laughs>